uh, is there, John? Okay, lovely. Everybody's up and, and, and ready. So, um, so without further ado, I maybe just I'll do a quick round of introductions of the panelists. So I think it's always easiest if, if people introduce themselves. Um, and to just to what I might ask each of you to do is just to give a quick introduction to yourself, the work that you do, and also very briefly how you've come into uh, generative AI and how it, it's uh, you've come into contact with it in your work. We'll go into detail later on in, in your workflow and, and so on, but just how did you get started in this? And uh, we're all kind of towards the end of the alphabet in our, our first names. But Rob, I might start with you first. And uh, yeah, thank you for, for, for having me. Um, so I am a, a health economist, um, but my area of specialty, I guess, is is in building uh, web applications and data science solutions to make models more transparent and more usable. Uh, and I think that's where some of the people from the, the call may, may know me. Um, so we, we do a lot of work with, with Shiny, for example, uh, or living HTA uh, and building software to make uh, make models easier to to either update as new data becomes available uh, or to uh, make more usable and transparent to to stakeholders who might not otherwise be able to engage with with the code directly uh, often via uh, via shiny um, where I've come into uh, using uh, bits of generative AI uh, very tentatively uh, is the the asset he package that, that i've been developing uh, essentially what this this package allows you to do um for those that weren't on the uh, the call on on, on friday on the, in a session on friday uh, is it allows you to to provide uh, a project repository that contains your your code for your model um and as long as your your your, your model is set up nicely in, in 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 unit functions as is kind of good practice it allows you to produce a network of visual summary of how those different functions or, or algorithms fit together uh, and then summarize any one of those small unit functions. Uh, and so what we thought originally was it was nice to see the visual of how all that works together. Um, but actually what um, we ended up realizing is that actually once you split up a model into lots of small steps, and I think this is going to be a, a, probably a theme that Will and, and Sven are going to touch on quite a lot, is splitting things up into small steps. Um, is once it is split up into these nice small uh, algorithms, uh, the, the the large language models are, are quite good at, at providing a a, a layperson summary or, or a summary of of what those um, that those small units are doing, um, and so we essentially set up a system where we send a um, um, a prompt to a large language model to to with the necessary information including the the arguments of the function the body of the function and documentation around it and asked for a, for a, for a layperson summary of that of that function and we're now just looking at kind of longer term steps around how we kind of instigate almost a chatbot style feel to allow you to ask questions about about that um so very early days but i'm very much more on the review side of of modeling rather than the, the creating side so yeah sorry it's a long overview but a bit of background about how I've got into this. Um, I was going to say, uh, describing your work in terms of chatbots may not be the way of uh, winning people over, giving people's uh, ex experience with chatbots and customer service. But no, no I, I understand that the point that you're making in terms of accessibility. Sven, could I ask you to give your, yourself your introduction and also that, that, how you've got into the use of generative AI? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Sven Klein. I'm part of the BMS Global HUR Economic Predictive Modeling Team. Um, primarily focusing on hematology, but as part of the remit, also very much looking into innovations in the field of health economics and health economic modeling specifically. And within that remit, I came across a generative AI um, just over a year and a half ago, looking primarily in terms of how we could leverage it in terms of optimizing uh, our current workflows and processes. Yes, I will also admit that I did start with the chatbot. Uh, I mean, it is just a very low threshold way to, to get acquainted with it, but quite rapidly was rather disappointed by the results that I was getting. I mean, people may have heard about hallucinations, all those kind of things. And uh, using chatbots, that, that is a common issue. Um, so quite rapidly transitioned to uh, accessing large language models through APIs or just running them locally. So they have much more control on them and being able to provide additional context to counter some of those uh, issues that, that you would not be able to, to deal with um, using a chatbot interface. So in terms of where I've been looking at 
at applying a large language models. Um, it's really across the entire spectrum. It's not um, confined to, to the interactions with R, but really looking at the entire HR process, going from landscape assessments to literature reviews, to uh, Afton synthesis uh, and the analysis underlying that, as well as then putting that into a cost effectiveness model, as well as reporting on the back of that and the dossier writing. But intermediate steps like protocol writing as well. So, so really looking at all the individual steps and what also gets me quite excited is that we are probably just scratching the surface at the moment in terms of what we can do. We are thinking of, well, how can we make things more efficient in terms of what we were doing? But there may also very well be, and most certainly will be actually, additional use cases that up till this point we were unable to do. So that there is also like novel research possible, but I'll, I'm sure we'll get into that later in the discussion. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I think that the uh, consideration of all the different applications is something that I'd like to come to in, in one of the following questions. So hopefully we get you to expand on some of that, uh, Sven. So, uh, Will, uh, could I turn to you just for your, your brief introduction and, and where you've got going with AI? Thanks very much, James. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is William Rawlinson, and I work for a company called Estima Scientific. And we're a company that focuses on applying technology in HOR. And for about a year now, um, my role has been to focus on generative AI applications, specifically within health economic modeling. So um, I started out looking at how to automate the generation of cost effectiveness models in R. Um, and I published a paper with Sven actually um, looking at how we could replicate um, existing published health economic models using GPT-4. Um, and we had quite a bit of success with that. Um, since then, I've moved over to focusing more on Excel modeling as well and how we can use um, LLMs, large language models to, to interface and adapt and update and create um, Excel models. My day-to-day -day role is, is largely around developing proof of concepts um, for specific applications. Um, but more recently, we've also started actually scaling up these applications and um, we're gonna be deploying them sort of very, very soon. Lovely. Thanks, Will. So um, just for completeness, I want to explain who I am, even though the focus is on me as the chair. But uh, so I'm a health economist based at University College uh, Dublin, and I mostly work in cancer prevention, uh, screening interventions and the, and the modeling of them. Um, I am an R user, um, not particularly expert. I'm not uh, an expert in, in any way in terms of the use of AI at all. I've probably been very much just the, the kind of uh, the the casual user who's had a go at using Copilot or, or, or one or the uh, the other chat based uh, tools, and I, you know just to sort of sate my curiosity, I've played around with them a little bit, um, but I don't have any sort of further experience. In that maybe in that as a sense makes me a useful chair. I can, I can ask all of the uninformed questions, and I understand that there's going to be a sort of a spectrum of prior experience with the within the audience, but I do very much get the impression this is something that I can't afford to not spend too much time uh, looking at. But I want to ask a, a basic question at, at the beginning, and this is just to ask for a definition of what is generative AI. So I'm, what I'm hoping for is that someone will be happy to, to volunteer, and then maybe the other panelists might be able to, to refine that definition. So is there anybody who's, who's, who's willing to offer the first stab uh, at offering a definition of generative AI in this context? Yeah, happy, happy to have a first go at it. So. I think what would be important to, to clarify of here is when we're talking about generative AI, people typically refer to it as just AI, and that leads to a whole lot of confusion. Um, AI has been around for a very long time. Um, typically what I personally like to do is to distinguish between the more traditional classic AI approaches, which are very much about discriminative applications, being able to label data. So, you show it an image and it is able to say, yes, this is a cat or this is a dog. Character recognition is, is another prime example of the traditional approaches. Whereas the generative AI is, is a bit different. So AI is the general terminology. Nested within that, we have machine learning, deep learning, 
and I won't get into all of the details, but when you really dive, dig deeper, you get in the end to generative AI. And the main distinction over there is that you are talking about a very large uh, model that has been pre-trained and is able to construct novel elements. So basically it is making predictions on what the most likely next token is. Um, perhaps also need to explain what a token is before I just start bandying around terminology. So uh, in the context of large language models, a token basically represents part of a word. That's so in order to think about this, generative AI is more or less just a more advanced way of a stochastic probability of what the next likely word is given all the prior words that have been given. So based on the prompt that you gave, the question that you had, what is the next likely word? And it builds the answer based on that. And I'll, I'll pause there and will then probably be corrected and refined by, by my co-panelists. I wonder, could I get anybody to talk about the, just the context of particular training sets and uh, and so on? That might be useful to think about the particular applications. Yeah, narrow it down slightly to to, to GPT-like models, so pre-trained transform models, um, rather than than something like text and and code. And I guess touching on what you just mentioned around um, training sets, because different models are trained on on different data have slightly different use cases. So, um, you know, GitHub Copilot, for example, uh, is trained on on a lot of the content from GitHub. So it's especially good for predicting uh, while you are while you are typing, say, in our studio, it can predict uh, what it thinks the the next uh, object or word that you're about to write is. And so it's very good at essentially auto populating as you are writing. So you might, for example, be you know working with the the empty cars data set. Um, on uh, in our studio, and you might want to filter the cars by, um, you know, by the by the um, number of cylinders or something. And as you kind of, if you were to type a comment, um, filter number of cars by cylinders, it would know that okay, generally that comment would um, come before uh, a bit of code which uses dplyr to filter um, the number of cylinders. And because uh, it's been trained on on all of the code from essentially all the code from, from GitHub, and there's lots of cases where users have done that, it's very, very good at doing that. Um, where it becomes trickier is when it, it it has a problem where very abstract and very different, uh, then it is, is, is slightly less reliable. Thanks, Rob. And Will, do you have anything else to add? Uh... Yeah, I mean, the way I understand generative AI is, is it's just AI designed at generating new content. And... Um, as Sven and, and Rob have mentioned, it kind of works based on the the kind of underlying statistics in whatever you know medium it's dealing with. So in text, the un underlying statistics of language, it's basically taking in some language and it's predicting what language it should respond with based on the statistics it's learned from absorbing huge corpuses of data. And Obviously, you know, everyone has this moment where they first interact with these models and they're completely astounded by where that kind of simple methodology can get you. Because, you know, you, you can even ask a model a fact like, you know, when did the Titanic sink? And that fact will be sort of encoded in the statistics of the language within its training set and it will know the answer. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess it's it's very remarkable kind of how far towards almost a sense of logic um, and intelligence we've got to based on these models that are essentially, as Sven said, um, just predicting the next word. And I know there's a debate we could have about what is truly novel content and what's kind of derived content, but I, I might leave that to, uh, to a little bit later. And I want to talk, uh, move on, thanks anyway, for the for the definitions and refinements, by the way, but I want to go on and, and talk a little bit about applications. So Sven outlined a few applications, and I just want to maybe give sort of the layman's perspective of, of, of what I think, you know, we might be interested in, and then maybe we can expand on the list. So a, a very obvious one is code generation for models. If we're constructing a model, um, you know, we, we want to generate code for a particular part. We want to do it quickly and efficiently and accurately. You know, I, we can use these, these models to, to go about doing that. Clearly that's 
limited to the extent to which the models that we want to to write have been previously documented and are available. So there's the, there's the code generation. But I know another thing that has come up in the discussions that we've had is about the maybe the role in model validation and quality assurance, and also in providing markup to models as well, which is a, you know a slightly secondary uh, use that maybe I hadn't appreciated, and I might get. It, uh, the, the panelists to expand on, on these, but I'll just give the, the third here would be literature review, including meta-analysis, looking for for both, you know, to cover the literature, but also explicitly to pick up certain, you know, parameters and and so on that we might use in our model. So there's the, the three big ones that I've that I that come to mind. So co-generation and the quality assurance and literature review. So could I ask the, the panel maybe first of all, maybe to reflect on those three uh, and and talk about, you know, to what extent they've they've used those Sven, I've got a specific question for you uh, that that I might come to if it doesn't come up in, in, in the talk, and then maybe we might expand on some some further applications afterwards. So, uh, does anybody want to, to take up any of those first? I could go for code generation. Um, so, obviously, um, programming a something like a cost effectiveness model is. Uh, incredibly complex task. Um, it's a large amount of code that you're aiming to produce. Um, you know, a typical model in R might be um, over a thousand lines of code. And if you've ever tried to use something like ChatGPT to get um, a response to a complex question um, that has many parts, you'll know that uh, large language models generally um, don't perform very well when they're confronted with a lot to do um, in a single question. So um, I've sort of investigated generating cost effectiveness models in R um, using generative AI. And the, the sort of biggest learnings from that have been that um, when you create an automated system to break down a complex task into different subcomponents, you can really start to um get that kind of level of accuracy and comprehensiveness that you're looking for so an example would be if you have a cost effectiveness model and you know you're going to have say seven different categories of inputs in there and you're going to have to calculate maybe a per cycle cost within each of those um categories uh if you ask an llm to do all that at once you're going to get a really bad answer it's going to be overwhelmed that's where stuff like hallucinations is really going to come in um, but if you can design an automated system where you might have a model at the start that decides what in input categories are going to be needed in the, in the cost effectiveness model and then divides up the tasks that are then um, performed by individual LLMs one by one, um, that's when you, you kind of take that small spark of intelligence and that ability to handle a small task one at a time and you can transform it into a system that can build something as complex as a full cost effectiveness model in R. And um, some of the research we've done, we found you know, very high accuracy in, in that kind of task when you design an appropriate system. And you know, in health economics, we use the same kind of methods quite a lot. So there is a lot of scope for, especially around you know, model types like Markov and, and partition survival, there's a lot of scope for building these kind of automated systems um, that use LLMs to, to create models. So I, I think that's a really promising area. And I, I would predict that in the next five years, um, that's, you know, model generation is going to be, is going to be a big deal with um, large language models. Thanks, Will. Thanks. I think that's an important insight in this, you know, understanding the, to use it appropriately, you need to take things then to bite-sized chunks. And I think it also, it's possibly somewhat reassuring to the humans that that kind of understanding of context and how things fit together is still very important. Uh, so, um, yeah, the appropriate use of the of the of the tool. Um, I don't know. Does do any of the other panelists want to expand on code generation, or do we want to move on to to some of the other questions about sort of uh, model validation and quality assurance? Rob, the, the, the question about model validation might be something you'd like to expand on. Yeah, I think that's probably the, the logical next uh, next step. I suppose um, the the same principles apply and that and that's we've we've kind of come at it from a similar perspective, I think, uh, with 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 the tool that we've been building. Um, we we're at an earlier stage, I think. The same principles apply and that what we're trying to do is split the problem up into very small chunks. 
um and when we do that we get um we get uh feedback and and, and outputs which look sensible uh and we've done some some kind of testing ourselves to make sure they that they look sensible uh, i think if we were to pass you know all uh 2000 lines of code in, and ask for a very detailed report from a large language model we would get garbage um but because we, as I said before, we were passing you know 10, 15 lines max at, at once with all the documentation, uh, it 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 can be quite powerful. Um, I, I suppose there's a bigger picture. There's a danger, right? That if if Will is uh, is is building uh, models with um, uh, cost effectiveness models using large language models, and and I'm then reviewing them. Uh, with a large language model, there's a there's a danger that we kind of almost remove the the human from the loop here, uh, and you hear that you hear that quite a lot. And so I, I suppose it's uh, maybe maybe another thing for 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 discussion to, at the end of the conversation around, you know, wh where is the the interaction of the human and, and making sure that we're using these tools correctly to to speed up review and, and empower review rather than uh, to to avoid doing any work. Thanks, Rob. And just one question, that, one issue that I know that came up when we had a discussion in advance of the call that Sven had, had, had I think, had brought up was this, it still relates to this issue about code generation, but it's about considering alternative model structure, you know, so in terms of if we think about uh, and structural uncertainty, you know, when we think about how to go and do uncertainty analysis in a model, you know, it's easy enough to go and do your sensitivity analysis on your parameter uncertainty, but the structural uncertainty is always the really hard one because, of course, you don't want to go and build another model and and, and so on. But it was mentioned in our discussion that, you know, generative AI can be useful to, to explore alternative model structures. That was one thing that I wanted to pose to, to you, Sven, if you had anything to I expand on it uh, on that particular topic and anything else in this area. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, perhaps also first to supplement what uh, Rob and uh, Will have been saying in terms of making sure that you chunk things up. So really cutting it up in, in bite-sized parts that, that AI is capable of dealing with. That is important. The other important bit over there is to provide it with uh, the relevant context. You mentioned the training data sets at, at the start of the session. HOR is a rather niche um, area. And when we're talking about the use of R within HUR, um, it's even more of a niche area. So the amount of data that is probably available in the respective training sets of all the large language models is relatively small. So providing additional context, for example, providing a vignette of a package of or of several packages that might be relevant for, for your modeling actually helps um, in getting more accurate results back. So you might post a question uh, by providing it a function that you have written. Uh, in addition, you provide it with a vignette on the package actually that you're using. And then you get much more structured and high quality responses back. Now to answer your question in terms of the structural uncertainty and how to deal with that. I think what we are looking at over here is the marginalization of the costs of uh, model development. So the actual implementations and the coding is going to be sped up. Uh, just my personal experience over there is that I think I'm about 50 to 75% faster in, in the coding, in the R coding that I'm doing. That might be just because I'm a lousy R coder, uh, but I do think in general that uh, people who are using um, generative AI see a speed improvement. For a specific example over here, I'm always struggling with ggplot and getting all the formatting just in exactly the way I want it. Um, I don't need to worry too much uh, about that anymore because I just pull it through the generative AI and it provides me with the code and I can visually check whether what I'm getting back is indeed what I intended to get. That's really speeding things up. But because of the marginalization of the cost and effort required to build models, it will also be easier to swap out some of the structural uncertainties within your model. So changing the core engine of your model, just having the generative AI write a different engine to your model. So going from discrete events or from a partition survival model to a discrete event simulation is suddenly not all that daunting anymore. Um, so that would allow us to explore some of the structural uncertainty and also look at what the impact actually is on the outcomes. Because it is one thing to be cognizant that there is structural uncertainty, but how much of an impact does it actually have? And I think 
in reality, we hardly ever know. Yes, we may have some suspicions, but I think the number of people that, that have the time and resources available to actually test all of that will be extremely low. <laughs> so I, I do think it is actually going to make it more rigorous, more robust in terms of the analysis that we do. It does, and, and I'll finish there, it does, of course, also raise the question about how are we going to review all of that? Because if we're going to do more analysis, more things need to be reviewed. And that's also getting back to the human in the loop part. I, I don't think this will make humans obsolete. It is just that we're going to be doing different kinds of tasks. Yeah. I, so you, can, you have made a very sort of pithy little remark. I don't know if it's something that many people have uh, have said, but you made some comment when we were talking previously about you know, what AI was going to do to the employment of people. Uh, I wonder, would you mind repeating it? I just thought it was, uh, I thought it was great. Yeah, it's it, it, it's not a saying that I invented myself. I, I shamelessly copied it. I don't even know from where, but basically people frequently get worried. Is, is AI or generative AI going to put me out of a job, make me redundant? Uh, I don't think so. What is going to make people redundant is people using generative AI will make people redundant who are not using generative AI. And that's that's the thing that I think people need to be aware of. Yeah, and, and very apt to talk about uh, shamelessly using something that's been generated before in, the, in this comment, but I think it's a, I think it's a, it, it's a, it's a nice one. Will or Rob, do, does anybody want to expand on, on some of the topics there? I can quickly expand on, on um, applications model review. So just as Van said, you know, um, the cost of development going down. If you have an automated system that can generate your models, the cost of code generation and, and development might go down a lot. Um, that opens the door for um, approaches like double programming validation. So you might want to build your model um, manually, generate an AI version of the same model, look at the differences, and that can um, be a good way to you know, make your manually generated model more robust. Um, so I think... With costs going down by a large amount, which which could could be possible, um, a lot of new approaches will be um, will be open. Yeah, I think arguably there's also still a, a gap there to you know for the human to really understand if the model has been coded one way or another. Has it actually fundamentally been coded a different way? Because you can have a model that's coded identically, even though every line of code might be different. You know, it, it could be using an identical structure, but it's just been coded different. So there's there still is important gaps for, for interpretation there. but I, and, and then I suppose we could argue back again, but maybe the AI is also useful for us understanding whether or not something is, is functionally identical or not. Rob, I'm I'm aware that you're waiting there. Yeah, so I think I agree with what Spencer said around um, the movement towards individuals using uh, generative AI. And I think what we're going to be spending our time doing will shift. So if you think about on a project, how long... Uh, some of the tasks around cleaning data, visualizing data, all of those kind of things may take. It's kind of almost disproportionate compared to some of the, the stats type analysis that are done. Uh, and so it may free up a lot more time um, from those kinds of tasks towards more interesting tasks around, um, around kind of conceptualization of models, engagement with stakeholders. So we've had a lot of discussion uh, throughout the conference on, on things like Shiny and how Shiny can make things more transparent just engaging with stakeholders to kind of understand their needs and well, uh, and then translating those through into uh, into models. Um, I think that's it's going it's to shift uh, where the bulk of the work is away from actually kind of hands on on very, very specific code problems uh, towards kind of more engagement with um, the, with decision makers, which is, is only a good thing, really. Yeah, I just uh, Sven's comment on on spending a long time making a a, a graph uh, beautiful. I can really that resonates with me. I think part of the curse of R is that you know that you can absolutely get a perfect figure if you can spend the time to tailor absolutely everything. Unlike in Excel, you know you're kind of constrained and you you lump it with with, with something that that's imperfect. But it's just a question of how long you you want to spend doing it. And I think that's an important productivity gain. If I think about the last very complicated figure I made and how long it took me to to to, to create it. Um, the, that, that there is perhaps one other application where, which I think is rather important in, in relation with R, and that is providing lay users, if, if I might call it like that, access to materials that have been developed in R. 
uh, R Shiny is a great way of doing that. But I do think that the generative AI might be another way of accessing uh, materials that would otherwise not be accessible to lay users. Just having an interface where you can just talk to it. I mean, right now we're, we're thinking about a chatbot, but we have already the multimodal models coming up now and which are bound for proper release later this year, um, where you can just chat, really speak to, to materials. That that might actually open up some of the materials also, for example, to patients who would typically not be able to interact with these kind of materials. But you can quite easily get layman summaries out of this using generative AI. So I do think that will also be a great boost actually to patient engagement with some of the work that we are doing in the HR sector, especially with more complicated materials that we're developing in R. Excellent. I, I did want to ask about, about and maybe I'm thinking more of an app academic application, but maybe it's somewhat related, but about literature review, I did mention it earlier on. And uh, I know we've had comments and that, you know, people have said that they found that AI is sometimes not terribly well performing, uh, uh, conducting literature review. And then the reflection has been, well, actually, that just depends on are you using it appropriately? And, you know, if you know how to use it appropriately, you can actually, you know, get very good results. I don't know, Sven, I think you made some sort of comment on that. It, it's it's a personal interest of mine because systematic literature review is something that I that I'm I, I do quite a lot of in my work. And if I could ensure that it was more productive, uh, uh, I, I would be very keen to adopt that. So I don't know, are there any any specific observations on that, on the, on the role of literature review? Um, yeah, to be honest, I think literature reviews is one of the low hanging fruit areas where regenerative AI will make a difference. Um, there are already several publications out there that, that have looked at using generative AI, either as full manuscript or just as conference uh, presentations. I think the main challenge that we see over there is where do we set the bar? When do we find it acceptable um, in terms of sensitivity, specificity? We know that humans are not perfect at doing systematic literature reviews. There's review fatigue, uh, if, even with double um, reviewing, there are still errors. We're aware of that. However, relying on systematic literature reviews being fully conducted by generative AI, do we accept that it is going to make any mistake at all, even if it is still better than uh, a human review? And over there, I do think um, a broad stakeholder discussion is important because I think the levels that we're currently seeing are at or well, are approaching already at the level of human level performance. Um, so it becomes a matter of an acceptability discussion. And I, I think that needs to be had across all the stakeholders in the HR field. So that does include consultancies, that does include HTAs and payers, that does include pharma. Where do we set the standards? And how do we, for example, go about creating a, a benchmarking uh, data set? Um, if we have a gold standard benchmark, then we know what the level is that needs to be um, obtained. And I know that I, actually some of the HTS are looking into this as well. I know that, for example, in France, the HTS uh, currently has a bespoke uh, work stream looking at conducting SLRs using generative AI. Yeah, I, I don't see the publications coming yet, but maybe in a few years we might have some useful guideline documents, um, you know, possibly coming out of uh, ISPOR uh, MDM on, on, you know, consensus I, guidelines on, on, on these. I, I, do you hesitate? I, 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 would, I would challenge that. Um, I, I think the field is moving faster than the guidelines at this point. The technical developments are going much faster than, than the guidelines. Just, just as an anecdotal uh, example over here, uh, when we looked at what GPT 3.5 did in terms of performance, on systematic literature reviewing, it was, I think, just above 80%, which, well, 75, 80%, something like that. GPT-4 already made a jump close to a 90. Uh, for O oh, now, we're rerunning the test as well, and I think we're above a 90 already. All of that is within the time span of a single year. Um, in general, and I'll, I'll see whether I can find a graph in time for, for the end of, before the end of this session. But there is a very nice graph showing that AI-related tasks, when we were thinking about OCR, so optical char character recognition, that took about 
40 years to get to human level performance with some of the newer developments and the new capabilities we're seeing that that is being squashed to just two or three years to get to human level performance. So it's really huge acceleration of the novel capabilities. And I'll shut up there. <laughs> Thanks, it's impressive and scary. And then Will, do you want to come in then? Yeah, I, th I think it's there's an interesting point around kind of what it takes to accept these, um, these methods and how it depends on, on human in the loop. So, um, you know, my understanding of SLRs is, is not is not really advanced, but, um, you know, it's common practice when you you build a model to, to do a very thorough QC of the model. Um, kind of everything that has gone into the model is checked, whereas with an SLR, you wouldn't redo the model, the, the SLR um, to, you know, confirm the results of the SLR. So there's there's a greater degree of, of trust that you've done it right the first time, essentially. Um, and I think in those areas where um, we're already using very kind of thorough human QC, um, the barrier to acceptability is almost um, lower because, um, you know, you, you have that safety net. Um, everything that the AI has done, for example, if it's coding an R model, is clear and presented before you in that R model script. Um, so I, I think there's just an interesting kind of difference there maybe between SLR and um, kind of code generation tasks in terms of what level of accuracy maybe that we need um, before before it becomes useful. Super, thanks, Will. Um, Rob? Yeah, I think there's, there's a couple of things that keep coming up, probably a recurring theme, which is kind of at what point uh, does the human almost step out of the loop in some cases um, versus remain in the loop? Um, and my suspicion is for, for SLR, we're going to be have humans um, performing them for quite some time, but with a second um, AI assistant, essentially, um, or vice versa. Um, and so I guess it's, it's at what, and, and then the second point, I guess, is at what threshold um, is it deemed acceptable to move over to AI only? And I guess there's a similar conversation going on with driverless cars. Like it's, it's a very sort of similar discussion around. So if a driverless car uh, hits somebody, obviously that hits the headlines and it's it's big news. Um, but obviously if, if driverless cars have a have a lower rate overall um, of accidents, that, that doesn't necessarily hit the news. So I suppose we'll have a, have a similar conversation where maybe something is missed or there's some error uh, with, a, with an AI model or SLR and that's big news, but actually all of the human errors and um, human emissions maybe maybe are just you know we're, we're not recognizing them um so there's, there's a bit of a double standard going on here yeah it's interesting i mean just reflecting what it means for us humans in, in terms of i always think that systematic review is a very very healthy thing to go and do to to understand the state of the literature good and bad and if, if we re remove ourselves from that task what does that do to us as scientists because you know i think it's uh if i think about the parts of 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 the field which i feel i have the best knowledge of i think it often dates back to the time when i was a phd student and i had the time to read read and read and i don't any, anymore and it's only what i get to review uh, as a journal reviewer that i get to re review so much so it's that's kind of a tricky uh, i think um as a as a as a trade-off but uh, i i see you've got the uh the, the the figure up there sven do you want to uh to, to expand on that uh, yeah, no need to expand on it. Uh, let's continue with the discussion. Just wanted to to show the speed of development and the increase of the speed of getting to human level performance of, of various tasks by, by AI in general, uh, basically accelerated with generative AI from, well, 20, 20 2021 onwards. Uh, thanks a lot, Sven. Uh, we're kind of coming up towards time and I want to maybe allow a little bit of time for discussion as well, but I... We... One of the things that came up when we were having a chat before was, I know this is after HTA, but we were having a discussion about the role of Python. I might actually get Will to talk about Excel a little bit as well, but we were talking about Python versus R and where this will, will, will take us. I, I just wonder, would anybody like to expand on that? Because I think it is useful for this audience to understand about where we invest our skills and uh, and understanding how they might be transferable over to R and, and uh, over to Python from R and so on. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in on that. So the... I guess the the models themselves are trained on an extensive code base, so it might be GitHub or or open source code from all the other sources, and so the quality what you get out of a large language model is in, is a kind of a function of the available data that it has, and so if we have no open source, now I've lost Rob, but I hope that's um, our models. 
Sorry, Rob. Could you could you just repeat Sorry, what you I said? I don't know if it was. I don't know. I think it may, may have been your connection, but you were you were talking about the the availability of of code for these models to to work from. Um, yeah. So essentially, the, the if we we have limited uh, training data for these models, so if if the, if the data that's got into the models in in R for health economics is is very limited, um, then they're based off of very limited information. If we have an extensive code base of of previous models that's all that are all open source, then you'd expect uh, the models to give to give better, um, kind of more accurate results. Um, so I suppose there's a there's an onus on the community uh, to make as much uh, kind of R modeling um, open source. Um, there is a challenge though, I think, and maybe I'll put this to, to Will and Sven to, to continue on, which is currently there is a big benefit of making your work open source, which is attribution. Um, and so I can say, you know, I've made this open source and that's great and people can cite it. Uh, and so from an academic, academic perspective, that's fantastic. But if we are all just using large language models to generate output and there's no attribution to the original author of the material, then um, that kind of benefit to make things open source diminishes. And so that's that's a real challenge here. I think the additional challenge that I'm seeing over there is that using a, a rack approach, so retrieval augmented generation, where you provide additional data along with your prompt to the large language model is one way to overcome the lack of information in the training data. But taking that approach, there's even less of an incentive to make your model open source because you might have a competitive advantage by uh, being able to provide that rack type of material uh, compared to competitors who may not be able to do that. The, the other comment with regards to R versus Python in this case, um, I think it is important to acknowledge over here that a lot of the research being done in the field of generative AI and a lot of the programming around that is all done in Python. It can be done in R, but de facto, you see that most people are using Python for interacting with the generative AI. So that there might also be some bias over there. And of course, you can mix using Python and R. I have, I have been calling R models from my Python code. <laughs> um, but at some point, you may start wondering, well, if I'm using Python anyway to interact with generative AI, why I'm not building my models in Python then as well? Also considering that Python can now be executed from within Excel. So just wanted to throw that uh, bump towards the end of this conference. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm mindful that I don't want to eat into Rob's time for closing remarks. And I also want to uh, leave space for some questions because I think we've got a very useful a panel here and I hope people will be comfortable to ask questions. But just before we go to conclude, Will, I know you may have something to ask, but just I was somewhat surprised about the, the possible use of generative AI with Excel and that it was, you know, that I thought was possibly a kind of an interesting bridging technology since we've got this kind of legacy use of Excel is is so embedded, especially in regulatory, uh, what they, regulatory agencies in terms of what they find acceptable and you use it successfully in, in your work. And I just wonder if you could have, you know, just give a very quick flavor of that and then and then anything else that you wanted to respond to in terms of the discussion. Yeah, so um, I think generative AI is going to have an interesting impact on the whole um, R versus Excel debate. And I think actually Python might be thrown in there as well um, because it is much harder to work with Excel using generative AI. Um, the most obvious reason for that is that um, when we interpret an Excel spreadsheet, um, we have to make a lot of leaps of intuition to actually understand what's going on. So for example, we um, look at a cell that says drug A cost, and we see that there's a value beneath that that says 50, and we intuit that that 50 represents the cost of drug A. Um, it's not so clear to the AI. Um, we actually use quite complex structures and manage to intuit those. Um, whereas when you're working with an R model, obviously you have your variables defined very clearly. Um, so it's much harder to work with Excel models. But a contrasting point to that is there are potentially larger gains um, in the time savings we can achieve with Excel models versus R models because building an Excel model takes a lot longer um, because you have to sort of you know, deal with this, this massive uh, sprawling spreadsheet. And if that could be automated, we're talking about a longer kind of amount of time that we can cut out of the process. And then just a final remark on that would be um, just to touch on the Python debate. Um, Although, you know, in health economics, we are using health economic specific techniques, we're also relying on a lot of um, basic coding skills. 
And the vast majority of code that goes into a large language models training set um, will be in Python. And a very small proportion of that code will be in R. So large language models perform much better. Um, they make much fewer uh, mistakes, basic coding mistakes with Python than with R. So, you know, we might reach a point where if generation of code becomes really good um, and it's a massive selling point, it might be better to switch over to, to Python um, rather than uh, R. Thanks, very useful insights there, uh, Will. I really appreciate that. Now, I want to very quickly throw it open to any questions um, uh, from the floor, just to see if we can do this very, very briefly, because I know Rob wants to also make some closing remarks as well. So I'm just... Uh, so if anybody wants to just unmute and just uh, uh, and, and ask a question, they're very, very welcome to, to that. Um, so uh, there's the question uh, from Niall about uh, uh, paper. Um, this is to, to Will, uh, Will and Sven on uh, your large language models automating uh, economic models. Do you, is, were there any other motivations for using Python over R and your R GPT API? Uh, do you have any... Uh, were there any other reasons for the choices there? So that was mainly a familiarity. I, I'm more familiar with um, making those calls in, in Python rather than R. I think there are libraries, Sven, um, you might know more about this, to, to call um, large language models from R. Um, there are. Uh, I have used them. Uh, the problem is that because of the speed of development of the generative AI, the API calls change very regularly as well. And those packages are being updated or maintained more regularly for the Python than for the R code. So we're already running into an issue over there. Again, it's also about familiarity. Um, I'm yeah, I'm personally also slightly more familiar with Python than with R, even though I use both. So it might also just be a matter of personal preference. But then the question is, of course, where's the bulk of the development and the developers and what are their preferences? And much of that is steered basically by... I would say uh, big IT companies in this case, much less so by health economic companies. Just just a way in there, you can you can absolutely make these these calls from from R um, in exactly the same way as the 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 HTTR two package, um, which will allow you to make API calls and and OpenAI have set up the um, uh, large language models in such a way that it's very easy to make these API calls. Whether they change the um, you know the headers and stuff on them, and 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 the the prompts that are required and the layout is is another matter. But but yeah, essentially, I, I think you can perform the same thing in R as you could in in Python. Thanks. And uh, Nicola Naylor has a, put a question in the chat. She's not able to to, to pipe up herself. Uh, she's uh, but she's talking about the dependency on particular companies who who provide the LLMs and just thinking about the the risk that that poses. You know, in terms of you know, I think we're all familiar with this, everything's free initially, and then we have to pay eventually. Um, are there any concerns that people feel about that? And Absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, quite a large concern over here. Uh, a lot of the work that, that I've been doing, at least, uh, and know Will as well, has been using GPT. Um, primary reason for that, I think is the, about a year ago, that was the best performing LLM that was around, and we wanted to have the most powerful model available to do the work that we were doing. Uh, since then, we have been looking at diversifying and uh, using other engines. Uh, Gemini, less optimistic about, but uh, for example, Claude version three is doing really well, uh, thinking about the Opus and Magnus models um, on Claude. What we also saw was that the transportability of the work between models is extremely high. So when you have large language models that are on approximately the same level of performance, such as a GPT-4 and a Claude 3, uh, you can easily transport the, uh, I would say, 98% of the work that you have done across models very easily. Also, the API, the structure of the APIs is extremely similar. If you have even more concerns about it, you can, of course, also just run it on a private Azure instance. You could use um, Amazon Bedrock, uh, to access those models, or if you have even more concerns, you might even run some of them uh, locally in-house when we're talking about uh, Llama, for example. So there are multiple ways around this. And I think at this point in time, we're in a much better shape with regards to vendor lock-in than we were about a year ago. Excellent. Can I just add one very quick thing to that? Um, 
I think the future having um, a lot of really good models available is going to really be beneficial to this field because um, you can ask the same question to several different models. Um, they can check each other's answers. You know, if, if the error profiles are different for the models um, in certain ways, it can help you come up with a sort of mo a more robust um, answer overall. So it's definitely a good thing if we have more equivalent different models made by different companies. Yeah.